So good morning, everyone, or good afternoon, or uh, good evening, wherever you are. Um, so this is the July 2020 um, call, recording on the, the 1st of July. I think it's 1st July for um, US time, 2nd of July for me. So um, we're just going to kick into it. We haven't got Gail here today. Gail is hopefully, fingers crossed, flying back finally from the London back to his home in Malaysia um, after being trapped in London in Europe for some months, so so good luck to him and Johan's uh, off on a on a um, on a uh, COVID related project. But we've got uh, Katie and Michael both here from the the community. So um, we'll just go straight into it. I'm just going to step into the slide. So what we got today, just a couple of updates from from uh, the resources. Um, there was a few fixes and patches um, uh, that's been made over the last nine months. So if you're building resources, sorry, last uh, six weeks, but if you've been building resources, you may have come across these. So um, the big ones are codecoverage.io um, have finally fixed their Azure pipeline support. So you can actually start uh, getting um, code coverage reports over there from your pipelines if you're using the new Azure DevOps pipelines. Um, there's been a new deploy task that, that um, Johan's been working on. Um, I think it's based on um, code from Simon that was um, written some time ago, but that allows you to publish the um, GitHub Wiki content. If you're using the, the auto deploy, sorry, the auto documentation generation code, um, that um, code can now be, that documentation can now be pushed out to the Wiki. Uh, automatically as part of your deploy process so that yeah, if you've got the new Azure DevOps pipelines and the resources um, and you are using auto documentation, this is definitely a, a good add on. Uh, I'll be moving uh, many of the ones I look after over, so I expect SharePoint and, and SQL probably go to. Um, PS Depend, which is a module we all use to to use uh, to manage dependencies, that now supports pre-release modules. So if you are doing some some testing where you need a pre-release module that's available in the gallery, um, you can now add that into your PS Depend file. And then finally, we've got Azure DevOps Test Tab is now available for log non-logged in users. That disappeared for a while, um, so you anyone not logged into Azure DevOps couldn't see the test results for for test runs, but now you can. So those are all that's all fantastic. We've got those in production. Um, we're going to kick over to to Jason Walker um, and Brian in just a little moment to talk about managing or we'll hear from them on managing local group policy DSC. But what I'll quickly do is just run through the latest releases to the gallery and, and what's been happening with the resources uh, and then it's over to over to you guys. Um, so we there has been a, a fair bit of progress made. There's now only 22 resource modules being that are waiting to be converted to the new uh, pipeline model. Um, we've completed 30 so we're well over halfway so that's that's pretty awesome. There's been a huge amount of work done there. Uh, the ones that have been recently converted in the last six weeks is Storage DSC, FSRM DSC, GIA DSC, Security Policy DSC, iSCSI DSC, XDSC Diagnostics, DFS DSC, S Channel DSC, and File Content DSC. There are the, the modules that have uh, been deprecated. Um, this is the same as last time as XDISM feature and XSystem security. They, I think, have been rolled into, I think, they were rolled into. Um, uh, computer management or weren't required at all. Uh, and uh, finally, there's a couple of resources that are not yet converted but are still active and planning to be converted. Those are DSC resource dot analysis and X bit locker. The ones that are going to be deprecated or, or or just left alone, not modified, not not moved over to the new module format, uh, X Robocopy, X WordPress, X PHP, and X Azure Pack. If there's any change to that, if there's any reason you guys can think of or come across that you need these modules uh, to be brought forward into the new module format, uh, just let us know, let, let, let someone know, and, and we can prioritize those. Uh, and finally, the, the releases, this is the list of the releases from the last last call, so uh, I won't read them all out. Um, Steve will kick into the content. So that's pretty much all the updates. So um, let's just go over to uh, Jason and Brian. Over to you guys. 
Thanks, Daniel. Um, am I coming through loud and clear? You're coming through loud and clear. Okay. All right, let me uh, share my screen. All right, so let's start off with the uh, problem we're trying to solve here. So uh, our customer, um, they wanted help to uh, automate STIGs, and STIGs acronym, uh, something along the lines of uh, security tech technical um, implementation guidance. Um, it's a, a document on how to uh, harden your servers, and it's something that um, uh, a lot of the federal government customers uh, have to uh, abide by, and they get audited on this stuff. So as we all know, if you want to manage something with DSC, you have to have a DSC resource. And um, the issue here, around um, a policy that is enforced by local group policy. Um, I guess let's, let's talk about the STIGs real quick. So here's a STIG rule, and um, we have check content, which shows the auditor, hey, go here to the registry, check this key, make sure this key says one. If it does, just good to go. And if it doesn't, um, here's the fixed text, and this is how you would, um, would make it compliant. So just on the service, you you look at this and say, well, shoot, I'll just use the uh, registry uh, DSC resource and um, we'll create this registry key. The thing, if you do that, the client side extensions won't pick that up and it won't actually enforce the policy. So the way you do this is you have to update the registry.pol file in your Windows System32 group policy folder. Then you have to refresh your policy. Um, the client side extensions will pick it up and then it will actually enforce this policy. So we started, uh, we saw this um, GP registry policy parser. Um, we saw that was uh, in a Microsoft team under the PowerShell team. Um, just reading the uh, description, we figured it was something for Nano, but never uh, actually got finished. And we wanted the peace of mind um, that uh, we wanted the peace of mind and responsibility that we were going to finish this. So we reached out to uh, Michael and and Katie, and they let us have this. Um, talk with Gail, and said, "Hey, let's put this in the uh, DSC community uh, repo." So we took what, um, and I'm gonna, I'm gonna probably misspeak on this uh, gentleman's name, but we, uh, Zaya Jolly, Jalali. We took his work, um, made it follow the, uh, the uh, high quality resource uh, guidelines, and we came out with GP Registry Policy DSC, which has two resources, and this is demonstrated best by looking at the code itself. So we have. Uh, registry policy file, and then we have re refresh registry policy. And all this guy does is, oops, all this guy does is uh, um, determines if we need to run G GP uh, update refresh, and if we do, then we do it. All right, so just a quick demo here. All right, so we look at this registry key. We see that there's nothing there. Um, if I open up, if I open up my, the local uh, GPO editor, um, we are going to try to manage this policy right here. We can see that it's not configured. Whoops. So I'm going to run this script that we see behind. Already, and we check the registry. Now we see that it's there, and there isn't a refresh button here. Um, but if I launch the editor again, and dig down here, we will see You. 
we will see that it is now enabled. So hold your applause. So this works fine and dandy for um, the native policies. We also uh, have it working with third-party GPOs, and I'm going to hand this over to uh, my colleague, Brian Wilhite, to show you um, how that all works. Look, can you guys, can you guys hear me okay, guys and gals? Yep. Awesome. Okay. Let me, um, let me share my screen as well. So I don't have necessarily a, a demo, but I do want to sort of reference some of the code. And I want to talk about some of the things uh, from a design decision that we, you know, worked through. So Jason in his, in his um, DSC configuration that's used, noticed that it um, had two resources that were being leveraged, right? So you had the, um, the part that modified the registry value, right? And then you had the refresh piece. So part of the design decision around that is, so we, for every time the set target resource runs and that first um, resource, the one that's setting the key, we didn't want to refresh group policy every time because it would take a configuration uh, a long time to run. So that's why there's two resources there basically the set target resource in lieu of refreshing group policy we write a registry value that that second resource checks to determine if the set target resource ran in the first uh, configuration block or the first resource that um, his configuration illustrated so when we were going through this, and I don't know if anybody has any questions. I'll kind of pause uh, for a moment before I get into GPT.I and I. Okay. So we discovered when we were running through this that there was there was technically a mechanism that was broken on our initial implementation of GP uh, registry policy DSE. Basically, there is uh, uh, the GPT.I and I file. Um, for lack of better terms, and and from my understanding, is it, it tracks group policy changes or local group policy changes on the machine, and there is uh, basically a 32-bit integer uh, for both um, the machine and the um, user policy. So there's basically two um, headers, if you will, or two values and the GPT.ini um, that will be updated uh, whenever group policy is updated on a machine. So what we ended up having to do is um, there's a, a blog or a doc that sort of describes how the GPT.ini works. So anytime a configuration is changed, whether it's user or computer, that 32-bit integer is updated. So basically, the, the well, the 32-bit integer is uh, can be broken down into two 16-bit um, values, and there's basic there's a high and there's a low, and depending upon which group policy change occurs, that number, whether high or low, is incremented. So that's what I ended up having to do here uh, when I added. Uh, the part that uh, increments GPT.ini or actually creates it if uh, it's not present. So if if the if the file is present on a machine already, then it takes those values and it determines, well, was it user policy that was updated or was it machine policy that was updated? And if it's machine policy, um, then it breaks the 32-bit integer apart, right? And then it increments the respective 16-bit um, value and then puts them back together and writes that to, back to the GPT INI file, which in turn, when group, when the, um, when update or GP update um, is run, then it detects, hey, the group policy changed 
So therefore, I'm going to have to um, go and reread the values and make sure that the uh, client side extensions are invoked. Um, so one of the things that uh, we should mention too is the way that we're invoking um, the CSEs is that uh, we're using uh, GP update. Uh, and basically we have like a helper function that uh, parses whether or not um, uh, it was successful or, or, or whatnot, or we, we answer uh, basically, we, we pipe answers to it, um, but we'll update uh, group policy and detect whether or not it, it needed a reboot or not. Uh, and we will also flag that, if I'm not mistaken, Jason, I think we're doing that, but um, but that's sort of, you know, the, the GPT part uh, in a nutshell and, you know, expand a little bit on the functionality of the resource. So I'll pause for questions, comments, concerns. Dan, I think that that's kind of it for from you know the the resource perspective. Unless um, folks have questions that we can sort of fill or concerns where they would you know like additional detail or information. So would you would you just just confirm you guys would you would have the first resource you do multiple of those and then you you add a resource at sort of the end that might do the re the refresh is that right? Is that my understanding? Right, exactly. Because what we what we were doing in, in PowerStig, which necessitated this resource, is we would have several hundred, um, you know, of of these um, configuration blocks, right? Yeah. And you know, after after all those run, because they'll run very quickly, uh, then that um, registry policy refresh um, resource is is run next, right? And that's what invokes the GP update. Gotcha. Yeah. Have you guys got any code that would take an existing GP, you know, group policy and turn it into the into the config? We don't personally, but I know uh, code exists. I think um, like Bobby Reed, who's on this call, um, owns that code. <laughs> uh, but I think uh, it's there's a yeah, it's, called Reverse DSC, which can do that sort of thing. Gotcha. Cool. Yeah, you can uh, baseline management will convert from group policy into DSC or from you know uh, SCM or a couple of the baselines. Gotcha. Awesome. But yeah, we really wanted to uh, bring this to the uh, community's attention. Um, we've had a lot of, uh, I guess, a chatter uh, internal to Microsoft about the, the best way to do this. And our, uh, our SMEs on this topic um, are not with the company anymore. So, uh, you know, all feedback is uh, is welcome, and if we are doing this wrong, we are totally committed to uh, getting it right. So let us know. And so, so people people can just go raise issues over and over in that repo in the in the DSC community um, project. Is that right? Yes, sir. Awesome. And they, you guys will take take PRs and the usual. Yep. Awesome. Pretty cool. That's that's pretty awesome. So, have we got any other qu other questions or comments from everyone? Any anyone got any other thoughts on this? Uh, can see where it can be used. Think thinks they got some good projects. They're going to start using it. In? So, I guess a question is: Is this seen as useful in a sort of a hybrid model where you've got the use of group policy? Because obviously, what effectively we're doing is setting registry keys. But um, um, the, I guess the nice thing is, is that this would sit in quite nice in a coexistence model where you've got some settings being set by policy and some being set by DSC. Yes, definitely uh, possible. Uh, I think the challenge there is you don't have uh, conflicting policies. You don't want the same policy to be managed by DSC and group policy, of course. But you could definitely, um, you could definitely uh, have some 
managed by both. Bartek's got a comment uh, question over in the comments. Uh, he just wants to see a simple config and how changing settings is combined with a single policy refresh. You guys able to jump back over to that? Yeah. Um... So do we want to see multiple policies and one refresh? Is that what the question is? Or the ask? Bartek, do you want to comment on that? Yep, that's that's a yes. OK, uh, so I guess I will share my screen again. Um, it really wouldn't look too different. You just have one more. Um, it would just have another uh, registry policy file uh, resource in here. Uh, let me see if there's an example. I think the examples all have just um, hey, I believe all the examples just have one resource, but it would it would literally just be um, another registry policy file resource um, setting another key, and you know the depends would have to uh, have all those. Gotcha. So you're always going to end up, you're always going to put a um, uh, refresh registry policy at the end. But is there any point, any just reason why you'd say I might do 10 policy entries, then do a refresh, then another 10, and then do a refresh? Or are you always going to just do that at the end? Um, I think it's safe. Just all, I'll do that at, at, at the end. Um, I guess if you have, I guess the only reason why you do 10, then, then refresh 10 and refresh, maybe a policy requires a reboot or something. But um, uh, I don't know. We could just say the re uh, the reboot for the end. And would you, if you if you did require a reboot, say, would you put the um, in the middle? Would you add the pending reboot um, resource, or would you just just let let it wait till the, right at the end and let the LCM do it anyway? Anyway, uh, it, it'll the it'll handle the reboots um, with the the refresh registry policy resource. No gotcha. need for the uh, pending Ruby. Oh, so it's just going to set the globe. It sets the global um, reboot flag. Correct. Gotcha. Yep. <laughs> yeah, as Bartik said, uh, sets global DSC thingy. Yeah. <laughs> I can't remember the name either. Um, any other? Um, oh, we got another question there. Uh, Oh, that's from Bobby. Just comment regarding the previous uh, uh, baseline. Uh, yes, baseline management. OK, so that's converting a, a GPO or baseline GPOs into into code into TSC. That's a bunch more comments. Any other any other comments, thoughts, you know, uh, feedback from the from the team here, from the community here? I do want to add that anytime you see uh, where a user policy, right, should be specified, you know, like using the registry resource was very challenging with that, whereas using the GP registry policy isn't because it will allow for uh, user based policy, right? So um, just kind of FYI there. So if you needed to make any kind of user configuration or policy configuration, this resource will do it. Whereas the registry resource, you would have to run like a PS DSC run as credential in order to, to accommodate that based on the user that's being um, configured. So just uh, just FYI there. That's a really that's a really key one. I think many people have probably struggled with that. Um, that's that's really important. Fantastic info. Any other questions from the community, or we, we've uh, we've managed to come in under half an hour, which is which is which is uh, quite quick. Can you dig into a little bit more detail on how that user side of thing works? Um, whether you need to do a DSC refresh to update it if a new user logs in, that sort of um, stuff. So that's that's a good point, and I'll kind of talk up to a certain 
to a certain aspect, right? Because the GP update is run uh, under system unless you specify otherwise, right? So the system account is the one that's providing the GP update. Now, if the user is logged in, right, um, GP update wouldn't necessarily run under their context. So they might have to reboot in order for policy to apply. So that's a good that's a good point. I don't know if that answers the question or maybe, you know, we need to kind of research that further, but um, that's something that is sort of, yeah. you know, a limitation with the way that it's maybe currently implemented. Yeah, that does make sense. Thank you. So, so is that you guys saying so to to apply that conf that um that that registry setting at a user level? You're not actually running as you're still running as the the LCM as system. You're not doing a run as a uh, user context. Is that correct? That that's correct, right? Unless I, I mean, that, I think the resource natively supports um, you know PSDSC run as credential, yeah. but. Um, you know, it's that's it's going to be difficult because you might have 50 different users logging into a machine, right? Um, so you're not going to create, you know, that many configurations with, uh, you know, that user, right? Nor would you probably know the password. So, um, yeah, it's running under system, which means that it may not refresh, you know, the, the currently logged in user's policy. I see. Yeah, I understand. All right. Awesome. Uh, Bartek has made a comment. Killing GPO is good. <laughs> any example? Any example with LAPS or or S Smith uh, SMTH that can't be without GPO? Well, that was that was what we thought at least. There's a comment uh, comment on the side. I don't know what you guys think about GPO killing GPO. <laughs> any comments? Thoughts on that? I mean, this is. I think. I think this is a good start to, you know, help um, users configure various things uh, outside of group policy. I mean, especially with, you know, maybe work group type environments where they can, um, you know, stand up a configuration that's, you know, a baseline and, and have confidence that it's being applied correctly, right, with some sort of feedback, right? Um, so I don't know that we'll ever kill GP, um, you know, as long as Active Directory exists, but I mean, this is definitely a, another tool to use for administrators to to get the job done. Uh, definitely, I think Bartek's comment uh, obviously use use in the DMZ sounds like a good definitely uh, a good space for this. Have you guys seen this used in uh, you know this resource used in um, up in VMs in Asia or out in the cloud? Uh, not to our knowledge, um, we know our uh, our customers using it uh, because it's a dependency uh, for Power Stig. That's what um, that's the solution we provided them to uh, apply the Stigs. Gotcha. Cool. So, any other any other comments or thoughts? Um, anything else you want to see? I'll kind of iterate this again, but I want to make sure that, you know, feedback is always welcome. We, you know, um, please give us feedback because we want this to, we want this to work well. Awesome. Yeah, I think uh, just to add a little bit more to the uh, user uh, GPOs, we do have um, a, a target type. So it's either going to be a uh, computer configuration, user uh, administrators, not administrators. And uh, we do have an account name. So if there's a, policy that is targeted at a specific user we support that and if you just leave that blank if you don't provide an account name it'll uh, apply to the uh, the default uh, user so all the users who log in after the policy is uh is made will pick up that policy right awesome that clear yeah that that i think that that clears a couple of my questions up yeah okay gotcha um and rick's posted the link to the repo so you can guys can Head over there, um, pull it from the repo. I think it's published the PowerShell gallery as well, right? So you can grab it there. Um, 
usual spaces. I think everyone's probably familiar with where things are now. So, yeah, if there's any other questions, otherwise, yeah, any other questions? No, otherwise we will um, we will say say thank you to Brian and Jason for for really taking their time to to come and share this with us and this is awesome stuff and I hope you guys keep keep developing it and um, that the community starts gets on board gives you guys a hand gives you some feedback gives you some and gets using it um, more of these sorts of resources we have around the the more tools we're going to talk it so thank you guys again really awesome and if anyone's got anything they want to share for the next next user group which isn't about five or six weeks um get in touch with with any of the community um committee so that's that's uh michael katie um myself uh gail and and johan um but otherwise i will stop the recording now feel free to hang around um and we'll uh, otherwise we'll see you next time